Hustle. My name is Daniela. And I'm Karina. And today we're going to talk about common challenges with clients. So we are going to be talking about five common challenges that we may run into with our clients as new therapists or as clinicians in general. Even clinicians that have had years of experience may find these situations to be very challenging. So the common challenges that we're going to be discussing during today's um, video is suicidality, uh, inactivity, clients that may be uninvolved or involuntary, clients that have a tendency to self-sabotage or be non-compliant with treatment, clients who have complex diagnoses, and clients that challenge our boundaries. So let's jump right in. So the first topic is suicidality. Why is this a common challenge that therapists might have in session? Because uh, there might be difference between cultural or uh, religious factors between you and the client. We also don't want to be very invasive by asking questions that are personal to the client and uncomfortable to share. Um, and then also every comment about suicide, suicide thoughts, plan or intent, it feels like a threat to us because we care about our clients. We want to make sure and we must make sure that they're safe. So to us, this feels that we have a lot of responsibility on this situation and we want to address it the right way. Now, Karina is going to explain what to do in this situation. So as clinicians, we have a legal, ethical, and moral obligation to be very aware and to have um, measures in place to manage suicidal thoughts, ideations, plans, etc. Now, a good place to start is to make sure that either in your intake session or if you're not responsible for the intake session in your first session with your client, to explain to them that you're a mandatory reporter. You know, getting that information out there and making sure that they're clear on that and that they're aware of it is a good place to start. Mm -hmm. In addition to that, conducting a risk assessment. This is something obviously that should be done early on and your agency may have their own um, policies regarding this. So making sure that you're clear on that. As well as continuing to assess on a regular basis a client that is suicidal until there's no foreseeable harm. Additionally, for clients that are suicidal, making sure that you come up with a safety plan and that you're documenting while your conversations with the client about suicidal ideations, plans, intentions, etc. And then finally, it's always really important to have our clients who have a history of suicidal ideations or plans or behaviors to commit to safety before the end of the session and making sure that you're documenting this well. So the second one is inactive or uninvolved clients. So many times clients are, are inactive in sessions or not very involved is because they are court order or they're coming to therapy involuntarily. There's going to be no doubt that your client does not want to be in the session and this can create a lot of tension for you, for the client and for your relationship with the client. So what do we do about challenges like this in session? So one of the things that we definitely need to do is be prepared for some uncomfortable silence. This can definitely be uncomfortable as a new therapist, but if you do the research, you'll actually find that silence is very um, important in the therapeutic process, especially for clients that are involuntary. So be prepared for that. And we are going to do a blog post on that soon. Another big um, component is to make sure that you build rapport. You may need to spend a little bit of extra time on this on clients that are involuntary or uninvolved in the process. And don't feel bad about spending multiple sessions building rapport. It's not a waste of time. It's an integral part of the therapeutic process. Um, now, besides that, you can also utilize motivational interviewing. There's a lot of evidence that suggests that motivational interviewing is an effective approach to use with clients that are involuntary. And feel free to do your own research on that, as well as read our upcoming blog post on motivational interviewing. And finally, make sure to make the sessions feel like it's a collaborative process and make sure to meet the client where they are, which is a big component of motivational interviewing. Number three non-compliant or self-sabotaging clients. So these clients can either be very talkative, pleasant in conversation, the perfect client, or maybe someone that doesn't talk that much, but something that they have in common is that they're not making any progress. 
Why? Because um, as soon as they walk out of the door, they're not applying the principles that they are learning in therapy. They're self-sabotaging all the time and then coming into session again, agreeing with you, being you know on the same page, but there's no progress at the end of the day. So as a therapist, you might feel very hopeless, you might take it very personal and feel like you're not causing a significant impact in your client, but Karina is gonna tell you what to do. So the first thing to understand is the client's baseline and to make sure that you're going at the client's pace. That's really important. Another thing to understand, especially as a new therapist, because I think that this is something that you kind of learn over time with experience, is that clients are not gonna change overnight. The client is only going to change when they're in a place mentally and emotionally to change. So it's not just that they're agreeing to therapy and all of a sudden magic is going to happen for them and they're in a place to change. It's possible that therapy with you is just a step in their process, but it's not necessarily the finish line. So that's definitely something to keep in mind. Another thing to keep in mind is that all behavior even self-sabotaging behavior is information for us as clinicians. So this can definitely help you in the process and to understand what it is that the client needs. Another thing to explore, possibly if the self-sabotaging behavior gets to an extreme, um, for example, in, in the case of clients that may have a history of substance abuse, etc., is to explore the possibility of a higher level of care. It might be something that the client needs and it does not mean that it's a failure on your part as a therapist. Finally, on that topic is make sure that you don't blame yourself for lack of progress. Number four, complex diagnoses. Disclaimer, we do not want to be discriminatory for this topic. We just want to be real. Um, as clinicians, we do have limitations on expertise and we have to remind ourselves that we are not responsible for the things that are outside of our uh, capabilities as therapists. So for example, if your client has schizophrenia, you cannot expect that them coming into therapy with you, their hallucinations are going to go away. So this is something to keep in mind and this is why we're bringing this topic. Now, the best way to approach issues of complex diagnoses as a new therapist is to recognize our limits and be aware of our proficiency. Now, we may not have a lot of experience with some of these complex diagnoses, but we do have a lot of support as new therapists. We have all of this educational material that we carried over from the grad school that's fresh in our minds. We have our colleagues that we can consult with about these complex diagnoses. And we have our supervisors that we're maintaining regular communication with. Now, if we continue to have trepidation around some of these complex diagnoses, then we really need to analyze whether it's an issue of confidence or whether it's an issue of proficiency. Now, if it's an issue of confidence, that's definitely a hurdle that we can overcome as new therapists with all of the support that we have. But if we feel that it's getting in the way of our proficiency, then at that point we need to consider whether we need to refer this client to a specialist. Maybe they need another therapist that has uh, some kind of specialization in that specific diagnoses or maybe they may need a higher level of care so it's all about self-awareness number five clients that lack boundaries this is going to be the client that's going to be calling you between sessions sending you a text at midnight uh, searching you on social media wanting to get closer to you asking you questions about your personal life it can be very stressful for us clinicians to have that balance between uh, being nice to our clients and having that close relationship and keeping this door closed. Um, it's part of our ethical rules and we um, cannot have our client on social media or knowing too much about our personal lives. Now, what can we do about this? The first thing that we need to do is check ourselves, believe it or not. Make sure that we're not allowing certain boundaries to be crossed. This can definitely be a slippery slope for new therapists and kind of uncharted territory. But this is something that if you have any doubts about the way that you're handling boundaries with clients, you can consult with your colleagues or with your supervisor. Now, if that's not the issue, then at that point, what you want to do is use this as a therapeutic opportunity. Make sure that you explore in session where this desire to cross boundaries is coming from and gather that information um, for your client to use in future sessions. 
Now, another thing that we need to do is make sure that we're redirecting the session. If the client is asking too many questions about us, and remind them that this time is about them. And the last thing that we need to do is make sure that we are setting boundaries with our clients. A lot of these clients that are pushing boundaries are individuals that have not had healthy boundaries in their life, in their relationships. So it's really important that we model healthy boundaries and we show our clients what it's like to have boundaries in our healthy relationships. The reason that we chose to talk about this topic today is because as therapists and as empaths in general, we have a tendency to really internalize the kind of progress that we're seeing in therapy with our clients. You know, and what we need to understand as therapists is that whatever progress is happening in therapy or whatever roadblocks we may come across, is not a reflection of how effective we are as therapists. So it's important to talk about how normal these roadblocks are and these challenges are and support one another in these challenges. So we hope that you found this video valuable and helpful for your upcoming sessions. If you like videos like this, don't forget to give us a thumbs up and we hope you have a wonderful